Amen. Praise the Lord. Turn to John 14 tonight, if you would. John 14. John chapter 14. And uh, John chapter 14, look at verse uh, 15, if you would. John 14, verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Father, we pray your blessing now upon the word of God. We thank you for each one here today. And we pray, Father, that you'll have your perfect will in each and every heart. In each and every life. We thank you and we praise you, God, for all that you've done for us. Lord, we thank you that you're still on the throne, that you still hear and answer prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We read here in John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, we left off last time going over some the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, in regard to Belief, we are to believe the gospel, of course. An unsaved person is to believe the gospel. Uh, Mark 1.15 says, Repent ye and believe the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ was the one that said those words. He said, Repent ye and believe the gospel. And uh, people say, Well, I don't, uh, I don't believe. They say, people say, I don't believe. And uh, well, they disobey his command. How can, how can people call him Lord, Lord, and do not the things that he says? That's what he said there in the Gospels. He said, repent ye and believe the Gospel. That's a command. And uh, he said, you believe in God, believe also in me in John 14, 1. So we're not to be a deist or a theist. Uh, we're not to believe just in God like a deist or a theist does. But we're to believe in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people believe in God. The devils believe in God, but they're not saved. James 2.19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Yeah. So the devils tremble at God. Uh, that's more than what a lot of people in America and around the world do. The devils uh, tremble. John 3.7 says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Here's a commandment for the new birth. Uh, he doesn't ask anybody's opinion. Uh, he doesn't ask what we think about it or what our friends think about it. He doesn't ask what a church teaches about it. He said you must be born again. And uh, the problem in the last 30 or 40 years, everybody and their brother professes to be born again. And, uh, and their born again experience doesn't match the Bible a lot of times. They think they're born again because they, uh, they got, you know, they joined a church or they got baptized or something or they uh, did this or that. Uh, we should be very careful to notice that the word baptism doesn't occur uh, anywhere in John chapter 3 there, 1 to 15 there, and he's talking about believing and uh, being born again. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. So the new birth is the mysterious operation of the Spirit that converts. In Luke 10, 20, Christ said, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven, but only on the condition of being born again. Uh, the Lord gave us a license to rejoice. Yeah. He said, yeah, rejoice because your names are written in heaven uh, there. And uh, so we thank the Lord for that. In Matthew 12, 33, he said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. Conversion is the only solution. And he doesn't ask us to whitewash the old tree or fix it up or prune it or engraft new branches upon it. What he requires is a different tree. It requires a uh, born-again experience. In regard to receiving the Holy Spirit, Christ in John 20, 22, breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. In Luke 24, 49, he said, Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Both of these operations now are taken care of when the Christian receives Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. But in the context in which these passages appear, John 20, 22, Luke 24, 49, the Holy Spirit has not been given officially from heaven down to this earth. In regard to following him, Jesus commands 
the believer has no choice about it but to follow Jesus uh, implicit, implicitly. In John 12, 26, he said, If any man serve me, let him follow me. In Luke 9, 23, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's one of the things that a lot of people in America don't want to do. They don't want to follow the Lord. They're not a disciple of the Lord. A disciple, you see the word discipline in that word. Disciple, discipline. And to be a disciple, there has to be discipline. And a lot of people in America don't want to follow the Lord because they have to de deny themselves. And a lot of people in America and around the world, it's all about them. So people that, people that when it's all about them, they're not going to deny themselves. And uh, they're not they're wanting to please God. Uh, he said, follow thou me in John 21, 22. He said in Matthew, uh, he said to Matthew in Luke 5, 27, follow me. He didn't say if you like, he said follow me. All right. That is the motto of the infantry school in Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, it's strange how an unsaved man will give his life for the government. And yet he'll not follow Jesus Christ. Thank God for all the people that have given their lives to fight for America. I'm all for that. That's great. That's wonderful. All right, we're not saying anything about that. But, you know, a lot of people give their life for their government or their nation, but they won't get saved. Yeah. Or if they get saved, they won't give their life for Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, you need to think about that for a long time. Amen. Chew on that for a few hours. Yeah, yeah. All right. In regard to prayer, the Lord has, has certain commandments. Christian life is to be characterized by prayer if you are to accept the commandments of Jesus. He said in Luke 21, 36, Watch ye therefore and pray always. Luke 22, 40, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. Matthew 9, 38, Pray that ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Luke 6, 28, Pray for them which despitefully use you. That's one of the hardest things in the, in the Word of God to do. Pray for those that despitefully use you and your their enemies. Those are commands. All right? Uh, the saint of God is made great because he has faith in a great God, and God commands faith. In Mark eleven twenty two, 22, he said, Have faith in God. That's absolutely essential. John 20, 27, be not faithless, but believing. The, the, the problem with a lot of people is, is that a lot of people, before they get saved, their life consisted of a lot of fireworks. Yeah. They had a lot of, a lot of uh, things happen, whether they were exciting or not exciting, whether they were, they, uh, a lot of people were in trouble all the time before they got saved. A lot of people had a lot of drama before they got saved. And then after you get saved, things settle down a little bit. And what the Lord does is God tries to settle us and perfect us. And sometimes we have to go through trials. Uh, he'll let you walk by faith and not by sight. And uh, you have to have faith. You have to, you're not always going to have the goosebumps. If you've been saved any length of time at all, you know you're not always going to have the goosebumps. You're not always going to feel like praising God. All right, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Yep. Job fourteen Amen. one. So this this life's got a lot of trouble, a lot of problems, and uh, waiting on God and watching God work through your troubles and problems is a part of that will mature you uh, in the Lord. In, in Matthew fourteen twenty seven, uh, Jesus said, "Be of good cheer, as I be not afraid." Jesus said, "Be not afraid." Several times in the Gospels. Folks, we don't have to be afraid. We've got the Lord on our side. Amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ commanded the child of God to search the scriptures. This plain commandment is found in John 5, 39. Search the scriptures. A lot of folks just take out five or six, seven verses out of context yeah. and pervert them and twist them and rest them to their own destruction. That's right. And uh, a lot of people, if I've mentioned many times, a lot of people know just enough Bible to be dangerous. Yeah. 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 All right? They know about five or six, seven, eight verses, and they don't even know those verses, really. Right. And uh, so it's, that's, America's full of that today. And that's why you've got to know the Bible. John 15, 20, Jesus said, Remember the word that I said unto you. We're to read, we're to study, we're to remember, 
Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that he hath not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. One of the ways that you know that uh, people in America have put the Bible down and don't really read and study the Bible is because of all the foolishness that they believe. As I mentioned many times, a lot of these guys on television and radio, these fakers and liars that claim to be apostles and claim to be able to heal people and all that kind of thing. All right, If people get in their Bible and see what the Bible says about things instead of just getting three or four verses out of context, and uh, they, they wouldn't believe all the foolishness and stuff that they believe. And it's a shame. So we need to study the Word of God, search the Scriptures, uh, the Bible says. Each Christian must daily let their light shine uh, brightly, if we're to obey the commandments of God. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So if you're saved, you have a light. You're to let your light shine. You say, I don't have a light. There's no light shining on top of my head. If you're saved and you walk with the Lord, yeah. folks, you have there's something about you when unsaved people get around you. Yeah. They know they can smell it on you. Yeah. They can see it on you. Yeah. that you have God. And uh, I've had several people through the years, uh, you know, I get on an airplane and uh, be sitting there for five or ten minutes and uh, somebody will say, uh, are you a preacher? I said, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. I was, getting, I was going to witness to, we had you know, a two-hour flight, so you know, i just been on the plane ten minutes. And uh, Get ready to ask him, you know, you go to church anywhere or something like that. But before I can, they say, uh, are you a preacher? <laughs> I never said anything about God or church or yeah. religion or nothing. Amen. And uh, so Mark 5, 19, Jesus told the new convert, that demoniac of Gadara, he said, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things he hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. Uh, those are commandments, and uh, that's what we're to do. We're to go home and tell our friends and tell our family, all right? And uh, he didn't say, well, if you'd like to go home and tell somebody about it, that'd be all right with me. He said, go home to thy friends and tell them. Go tell. That's really what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to go tell. Go tell people what Jesus has done for us. You might not be able to answer every Bible question they ask, because there's a lot of smart alecks in this country. And they know, they know a couple of questions to ask, you know, Christian people about the Bible, trip them up and so forth. You say, well, I really don't know about that. I, mean, I, can, I can look it up for you and get back with you, but I do know that I got saved. I can tell you how I got saved, and you need to get yeah. saved. Yeah. Uh, each Christian must have a supreme love for God. In Mark 12, 30, he says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Now, does that mean you're to be perfect? No. Nobody's perfect. The Lord knows that. This is the first commandment. But you're to love God with everything that's within you. In other words, everything that you have within you, you're to love the Lord the best of your ability. Are you going to trip up? Yes. Are you going to sin? Yeah. Are you going to think things that are wrong? Yes. We're in this flesh. That's part of the growth process uh, in the Christian life. Matthew 4.10, the Lord answered the devil. He said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. What the devil tries to do is to get every human being to not worship God. He wants you to worship something else. Yep. He wants you to worship. You say, I don't worship the devil. Well, he wants you to worship the things of this world then. He wants to dangle something in front of you, and, uh, and you, go, you go after that. You'd be surprised why you'd be surprised why some people don't get saved. Because there's a particular sin that they like. And sometimes they've told me through the years, especially men, they'll say, well, I like this, or I like to drink, and I like this, and I like women, and I like this, and I like that, and I don't want to get saved. And, uh, and uh, or they'll say, I like, uh, you know, like, I like to hunt, and uh, I can't go to church on Sundays because I hunt on Sundays, or I golf on Sundays, or I, this and that. And a lot of Christians use some of the same type of excuses why they don't sell out to the Lord and serve God. But it's all at the judgment. It's going to be a sad time uh, for those that don't put the Lord first. See, God doesn't make us robots. We can serve the Lord or we don't have to serve the Lord. But God, God won't make you serve him 
but he can make you wish you did serve him. Amen. And he's not a bully. He does that because he knows there's a judgment ahead of time. There's a judgment ahead of time. And uh, uh, nobody told you to try to love God. Nobody told you to, uh, you know, try to love the Lord or if you can. He said, Thou shalt worship the Lord, thy, love the Lord thy God with all their heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, all thy strength. This is the first commandment. All right? So everything that's within us, we're to put the Lord first. Now, what does that mean? What it means is, you're, it doesn't mean being perfect. It means you're either walking in fellowship with the Lord or you're not. You're either walking with God or you're not. It does, it's not a thing where, I'm, well, preacher, nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. I can't. No, it's, he's not, he didn't say be perfect. He didn't say be sinless. He said to love the Lord with everything that's within you. Peter loved the Lord. I believe that Peter loved the Lord. But did he put his foot in his mouth a lot? Yes. You see, Paul loved the Lord, but he messed up. He went to Jerusalem, went to a place in the book of Acts he shouldn't have gone to. I mean, everybody, everybody in the Bible messed up. David messed up. He committed adultery. And had a guy murdered. And David's the only man in the Bible that God says he's a man after my own heart. I'm glad God doesn't look at just one aspect of a, a man or woman's life. He looks at the whole life. Yeah. God looks at the whole life. You see David in one battle after another in the Old Testament. I mean, chopping people's heads off and killing people right and left. But then he commits adultery. And that's usually what people emphasize when, they, when you speak of David. You want to know why? Because that's human nature. Mm -hmm. Human nature likes to dwell on those types of things usually sexual sins, and that type of thing for some reason. I mean, they won't even, know if the guy's murdered somebody, they won't even talk about the murder. They'll just say, well, he, he committed adultery. Mm -hmm. You need to think about that for about four or five hours too, amen. <laughs> Human nature. Uh, a lot of Christians are thin-skinned, wishy-washy, anarchist. Uh, they believe that their own opinion is relative to somebody else's opinion who is relative to somebody else's who's supposed to know something they're talking about. And uh, they don't know what they're talking about. That is, a lot of Christians today, they have less character and less principle, uh, less ethical rooting in the groundwork of truth than the average unsaved man did in this country 75 years ago. <coughs> a lot of unsaved people 75 years ago, 100 years ago, lived a better life than a lot of Christians in America do today. Amen. And that is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, when you talk to some people about these things, their response is, oh, well, uh, you know, you think you're right, everybody else is wrong, but that's not, that's not true. We're, we want to use the Bible to be right. In Mark 12, 17, Christ said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So Christians are to love the authority and obey the authority, whether the authority is from God or not. They're to pray for those in authority, and they are to be subject to the powers that be, according to Romans 13. You're to obey the laws of the land as long as the laws of the land don't go against Scripture. Plain Scriptures. And in other words, you know, the speed limit 65 miles an hour, you're going down the highway, and uh, you're going 80 and the trooper pulls you over, and you say, well, uh, I'm, I'm doing what I believe is right on this highway, and uh, I'm my own authority. I'm not going to be subject to the laws of the state. He's going to say, well, here's a nice big juicy ticket. Yeah. Go pay your $200 ticket to your local courthouse or whatever, whatever, whatever it is. And uh, so uh, you have to obey the laws of the land. Paul, or Peter said we ought to obey God rather than men, Acts 5.29. We have a duty to our neighbors. In Matthew 19.19, 19, Christ said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Luke 6.31, As you would that men should do to you, do also to them likewise. These are commands of Jesus. The Lord had some specific things to say about covetousness. Our lives are to be heaven-centered. They're not to be earth-centered. In Luke 12, 15, Jesus said, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. All right? 
He said, take heed, beware. Uh, my wife and I listened to a man preaching this morning on the radio, and he took Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and 2 there as his text, and he talked about Solomon. Of course, we, I, I taught this verse by verse, Ecclesiastes. And he, uh, he gave three G's, three G's. He showed us uh, the uh, goal, the goals of... Uh, uh, the goals of Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapters 1 and 2, the goal, and he showed the gain of Solomon, and showed everything that he gained, everything that he had. He told about a lot of other people, he's got a lot of billions of dollars and things in this world. This world. And then he showed the goals and the gain, and then he showed the grief. And he brought it all down to the grief and said, this man was not happy. He said, therefore I hated life. Ecclesiastes 2.17. You know what that shows you? Take heed, Jesus said, and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Real life is not in things. Now there's nothing wrong with having nice things. But even those of you that might have a lot of nice things, you know those things don't really bring deep contentment and joy and peace in your heart and life. It didn't Solomon. And Solomon had ten times more than probably all of us here in this sanctuary here tonight put together combined. He was the richest man. Yeah. First Kings 3. The wisest. God gave him more wisdom and more riches and material possessions than anybody ever. And he said it still didn't satisfy him. They never do, as I've said many, many times. God has so constituted you. He made human beings. He has so constituted a human being that the only way that they can be happy, joyful, contented, have real deep peace and victory in their life is A, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and B, a daily walk with their Creator. Amen. That's it. Now, God blesses you and sprinkles you with some nice material things and a nice bank account and some nice things in this earth. Praise God for it. But remember, he's the one that gave that to you. He's the one that gave it to you. And uh, he can take it any time. And Job learned that. Job, Job was the richest man in the East. He had all those material possessions. He had all those animals. He had ten children and, uh, and everything else. And everything was gone. The Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And God, he's hung in there and stayed by the stuff. And God blessed that man with twice as much as he had before. Yeah. Man, did he go through it. Job in the Old Testament, I mean, there's a lot of great saints. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, I mean, Noah, Daniel, a lot of great saints in the Old Testament. But Job, he was up there pretty high. Paul, probably in the New Testament. And uh, these men were totally, they totally God. Everything was God. And, uh, if you would have got around them, you'd been, you'd been able to see that. Matthew 5, 42, Jesus said, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not, not thou away. All right, he's talking about uh, giving to people and loaning to people and that type of thing there in that verse. Matthew 6, 19 and 20, Lay not for yourselves treasures upon earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, people ask me through the years, they say, How do you lay up treasure in heaven? I mean, how can you get stuff and throw it up into heaven? It's not what he's talking about. You lay up treasure in heaven by getting saved and living for Jesus. Yeah. There's no magical thing to this. You get saved, you're faithful and obedient to God. You say, well, preacher, I'm not a missionary in the backwoods of New Guinea and winning the heathen to Jesus. How can I? Every born-again Christian can lay up treasure in heaven. Male, female, young or old, by being obedient to the Lord and following the Lord and uh, doing what he wants you to do and trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. So, uh, have you put out as much money for getting out the word of God as you have for dog food this month? Or cat food? How about veterinarian bills? You see what I'm saying? You think about that. 
Have you spent as much money getting out the Word of God? And uh, and uh, I mean, I believe in tipping. I tip. I tip when I go to restaurants and stuff like that. Uh, these people that work in these restaurants, they don't make hardly nothing much of them. And so you know, I try to give them at least twenty percent. Try to give twenty percent, and uh, and so forth. But I mean, do you give as much to the church or to get out the Word of God as you do tipping people in restaurants? That's something to think about. And uh, in other words, our priorities. Christ said in John 14, 23, if a man love me, he will keep my words. If a man love me, he will keep my commandments. If God doesn't have your pocketbook, he doesn't have you. All right? You don't let money run you. You run money. Yeah. You tell money what it's going to do. And uh, you don't let money tell you uh, what you're going to do. In regards to this matter of hypocrisy, it's just a matter of priorities. It's not just money. It's your time. It's your what you put what you put first in your life. Priorities. Uh, in regards to this matter of hypocrisy, beware of becoming a hypocrite. Luke 12, 1, Christ said, Beware the ye of eleven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Matthew 23, verse 2 and 3. So let's be like Christ in meekness, lowliness, and humiliation. Christ said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls. But he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I got a message back there. Matt's got it on CD. I preached, I don't know, a year or two ago. Uh, the, the yoke of the Lord Jesus Christ, or take my yoke upon you, or something. Some new yoke <laughs> out of that verse there. And I talk about a yoke and what a yoke is used for in plowing and that type of thing. And uh, there's several points to the message. Uh, we are to love the brethren. In John 15, 12, Christ commanded, Love one another as I have loved you. Matthew 18, 10, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. Matthew 5, 24, First be reconciled to thy brother. Luke 17, 4, And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, thou shalt forgive him. Luke 6, 37, judge not, condemn not, forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. The greatest follower of Jesus Christ who ever lived, or at least one of them, the Apostle Paul, said, forgiving one another, uh, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, Ephesians 4, 32. Unforgiveness puts you in bondage. Yeah. Unforgiveness, when you don't forgive, it, 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 just, it destroys you, it, it hurts you, and you become bitter, and uh, you're the loser. You don't forgive. Uh, Ephesians 4.32. So these are commandments. Christ was set a very high standard for his disciples. He said in Matthew 5.48, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Luke 6.36, Be, now when he says be therefore perfect, he doesn't mean sinless. All right? Perfect is talking about being complete. All right? Being complete. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, and I'll show you this. 1 Peter chapter 5. Um, he's not saying, he's not saying be perfect or be sinless. He's saying uh, look here, first uh, 1 Peter 5, 10. 1 Peter 5, 10. But the God of all grace who hath called us and to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. See that? So that's that's the, uh, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Uh, amen. So the perfect there is not uh, you being sinless. The perfect is not being sinless. The perfect is being complete, verse 10. Uh, establishing you strengthening you, settling you. That's what he's talking about, being perfect. Job talked about it. Let's turn back to Job. Or no, Philippians. I'm sorry. Sorry. Philippians chapter 3. Paul talked about it. Job talked about it too, but I want to go to Philippians 3. It's coming to my mind. Uh, Philippians 3. Uh, Philippians 3. Verse uh, 11. Philippians 3.11. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, 
either we're already perfect. See that? See that perfect? Paul says he isn't perfect. And uh, verse 15, let us therefore as many as be perfect. He says he's not perfect in verse 12, but then he says he's perfect in verse 15. All right? But you have to read each verse in its context. Perfect doesn't mean sinless perfection in either verse. It means complete in regards to what he's talking about. In this verse, Philippians 3.12, he's saying that he hasn't yet gotten the complete knowledge and attainment that he sought in verse 10 and 11. In verse 15, he is saying that he is completely following the attitude toward the past and future that he expressed in verse 13 and 14. In other words, in verse 12, he's talking about verse 10 and 11. All right, being, neither were already perfect. In the sense that I, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. See verse 10, that I may know him. When you first got married, you knew your wife. But you don't know her like you know her now. When you first got married, you knew your husband. But 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, you know them better. When you first get saved, you know the Lord is your Savior, but you know the Lord more you, that, I might, that I may know Him, verse 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death. God makes you conformable unto His death, a crucified life by the things you suffer, verse 10 fellowship of his sufferings. It gets you to know the power of his resurrection. In other words, resurrected power in your life that I may know him. You get to know, the more you get to know the Lord, the more you come to church here preaching and teaching the word of God, the more you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, the more you're in your Bible, you're praying on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis, you grow in the Lord. And that's what 1 Peter 5.10 says. Strengthen, settle you, make you perfect, establish you. That's what God does. He establishes you in the faith. And you won't be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Because there's all kinds of wild, crazy doctrines out here in society. Because people know two or three verses I mentioned earlier. They know just enough Bible to be dangerous. And uh, they take them out of context and everything else. So verse 12, not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I have apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. 13. But this one thing I do. What do you do, Paul? Forgetting <clears throat> those things which are behind. you got to forget those things which are behind. And reaching forth unto those things which are before. Now, it's literally impossible to forget everything in your past. And the devil will constantly bring them up. But you, you've got to do your best to get them out of your head. In other words, get out of here, devil. That's what the, the, Jesus did. When the devil tempted Jesus, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. And he quoted scripture. So you learn that word of God and you quote scripture to him when the devil attacks you. But get thee behind me, Satan. The Bible says this. The Bible says that. And uh, the devil, the battleground is your mind. The battleground is in the mind. Let me show you 2 Corinthians 10. Paul said about this. 2 Corinthians 10. I want to show you the battleground is in the mind. 2 Corinthians 10, and uh, what's this old saying say? You can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop from making a nest in your hair, or whatever, however it goes. So you can't stop a lot of the thoughts the devil puts in your head, but you don't have to just dwell on them for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 2 Corinthians 10, verse uh, 3. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare. You see that? You're in a battle. You're in a fight. It's a spiritual fight. It's not with your fist. It's not with grenades and guns and knives and ball bats. This is a spiritual warfare. And folks, you fight a spiritual warfare with spiritual weapons. Your spiritual weapon is the Word of God. That's why the devil don't want you to ever read it or hear it preached or taught. They'll fight you. 
and your prayer. Praying and in the Word of God, the Bible, are your two weapons. You say, what about faith? Faith is the victory, but faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Yeah. Romans 10, 17. So in essence, it's really the Word of God. That's why the devil fights you about reading your Bible and studying your Bible. Uh, verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they're not carnal. The weapons aren't carnal. Carnal weapons are guns and knives and grenades and that type of thing, physical warfare. Now, when nations go to war against another nation, they use carnal weapons. Those are carnal weapons. We use spiritual weapons to fight our spiritual battle. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down, notice this, in the context of talking about warring, in verse 3, the word war, verse 4, the weapons of our warfare, verse 4, in the context of all this, and strongholds in verse 4, the last word, in the context of verse 3 and 4 about warring, and about going to war, and fighting and battling, verse 5, he talks about your mind. Casting down imaginations. You see the word image in there? Images? That's what television is. It's images. Casting, you got to be careful what you watch on TV and on your screens. And uh, my son Aaron's got a book out on screens. Some of you got it and read it. And uh, the television screen, your uh, cell phone screen, your computer screen, and every other screen. Casting down, uh, be careful, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. It's your thought life to the obedience of Christ. In other words, you've got to cast down those imaginations and those thoughts. The devil comes in there and puts a bunch of junk in your head, so you get out of here, devil. I've got the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Get thee behind me, Satan. It's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the temptation of Christ, Jesus quoted the, the scripture every time to the devil. That's why it's imperative. Imperative means it's absolutely necessary that you know the word of God. Now, I'm not saying you've got to quote 10,000 verses, but you've got to know the Bible well enough to know what the Bible says about spiritual warfare. From the time you get up in the morning to the time you sleep at night, when, all right, you're going to have a fight with your flesh, the devil, and the world. Those are your three enemies. Every Christian has that from the time they get up to the time they go to bed. You say, how long does that last? It lasts until you die and go to heaven. So, uh, verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, in other words, you've got a fleshy body, you walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. All right? So, we don't war after the flesh. Our warfare... Uh, our warfare is a spiritual warfare, according to the Word of God. All right? So, uh, turn to Galatians 5, 2 Corinthians, and then uh, Galatians. The next book is Galatians. And this is, uh, this is what you want to do. Galatians 5, verse 16 and 17. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. How do you walk in the Spirit? Walk obedient to the Lord. You're just obeying God. It doesn't mean you're sinless. It doesn't mean you're perfect in the sense of being sinless. It doesn't mean that th bad thoughts don't come in your mind occasionally. It doesn't mean that you don't have, you know, you might say things or do things wrong once in a while. It doesn't mean that. But it says, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. This old flesh is rotten to the core. Amen. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now look up here just for a moment if you would. Here's the way it is. You got the spirit and the flesh, and these fight against each other. Every second that you're alive, yeah. unless you're sleeping, Sometimes the devil even try to mess you up while you're sleeping. <laughs> but they war. They fight against each other. Now, if you feed the spirit man more than the fleshy man, 
You feed the spirit man with the Bible, the prayer, coming to church here and preaching and teaching, the fellowship with the saints of God. We need all this, folks. Yeah. you got to have that. All right? You feed that spirit man more. I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to be irreverent when I say dogs. I'm just kind of using this illustration. You feed that dog more than you feed that fleshy dog. All right? The spirit man, the spirit dog's going to... He's going to be able to override that fleshy man. But if you feed the, the fleshy man with the trash of the world, you sit in front of the TV for 10 or 15 hours a day and take in all that junk, all right? I'm going to tell you what, you're going to be thinking and probably acting like the world. And you're going to be, that, that old man, that old fleshy man is going to have dominance over the spirit man. So you want the spirit man to be able to overcome the old flesh. So you, so you can walk in the spirit. One of the reasons why a lot of Christians in America don't have the victory that they should have is because they don't walk in the spirit. They're not obedient to the Lord. They're not faithful to the Lord. They don't pray. They don't witness. They don't come to church faithfully. If you're preaching and teaching in the word of God, you got to have it, especially in the day and time we're living in today. you got to have it. All right, so uh, we, are, we are to, uh, uh, let's see here. All right, uh, we're to preach the gospel wherever we go. We're to tell people about the gospel. Uh, God's people are to minister the word to each other. Great typology of this was set forth in John 13 when the Lord said, uh, He got through washing the disciples' feet. He said in John 15, 3, Now you're clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. The word of God will cleanse you. Read the Bible. You say, I read parts of the Bible, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. Read it anyways. Yeah. You'll be surprised. Uh, the guy gave an illustration. I can't remember the type of uh, thing that he used, the instrument that he used. Uh, he was talking about clean, putting, running water through something, and uh, and you it, you clean it. You keep walking, running that water through that conduit thing, and it gets all the grime and the grease and the dirt out of it. And it might not look like much is being accomplished, but the more water you run through it, now you're clean through the word, the water of the word of God. Yeah. Ephesians five talks about. You just keep reading that Bible, trying to memorize that Bible coming to church and hearing the preaching and teaching of the Bible, and that Bible will help you to grow. Your faith will grow. The word of His grace, which is able to build you up, grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. It's a spiritual growth. We're all, I don't care if you've been saved 55 years or 75 years, you're still growing in the Lord. We've all still got a lot to learn. And so, uh, it's a growth process. It's a, when you first get saved, you're a babe in Christ, and then you grow. And uh, God wants to establish and strengthen and, and settle you. All right. Uh, this great typology is set forth in John 13, at, plainly. Uh, he's t telling that uh, there's, going, there's more going on there than just foot washing. Lord Jesus Christ didn't say about the example, do what I have done to you, the foot washing, but do as I have done unto you, humbling himself and ministering to them. Christians are to minister the word to each other. That helps you. It helps you to grow. You talk about the word of God. And uh, you chew on verses. <coughs> you say, I was thinking about that verse the other day, you know, and you talk about the Bible. and you, That helps. And you pray to God. And you, God will answer your prayers. Praying isn't just some little formalistic religious thing that we do just so we can look good and God will think we're something holy and righteous and this and that. God wants you to pray because he wants to answer your prayers. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ gave us commandment in regard to his second coming when he said, Be ye therefore ready, also ready for the Son of Man uh, cometh at an hour when you think not in Luke 12, 40. We're to be ready for the second coming of Christ at any moment. And uh, this is imperative. Be therefore ready. All right? Uh, those are orders. Uh, if the average born-again Christian had the attitude that the Prussian, 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 P-R-U-S-S-I-N, 
Prussian, our military staff had at the War College in Konigsberg, Prussia, we would have a better kind of Christianity. To the German general, an order is an order. An order to a Christian, a lot of Christians, is a suggestion. And they'll do it if they feel like doing it. If they want to do it. If they don't want to do it, they will do it. Uh, so, uh, of course, when you've done away with the King James Bible, you've done away with the authority. And once the authority is done away with, then you leave a congregation in the place where anybody can pick any version they'll preach or teach, whatever they think. And uh, then you have anarchy. All right? You've got to have one authority. We have the authorized version, the King James Bible. All right? Uh, we're to be faithful unto death. Matthew 24, 13 speaks about this, a matter in regard to the tribulation. It tells the tribulation saints that they'll be saved if they endure unto the end. All right? Uh, the Christians have been told that not even things to come in life or death shall separate us from the love of God, Romans 8, 38, 39. Still, we're told to run the, run, with, uh, run the race with patience, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, All right, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. We're to run to win. Paul, at the end of his ministry, says that he was an example to the believer and a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. In regard to this pattern, he says... 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, if I mention, I use this illustration many times, but if you've ever been on a golf course, you start hole, hole number one, and they got 18 holes of golf. And you have sometimes wait on the people in front of you, but you have to go here, the second hole, the third hole, the fourth hole, and that type of thing. All right? Paul said, I have, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course, personal course. Every single person has a personal course. As soon as you got saved, God has a course for you to run, and your course is not my course. And my course is not your course. He uses the word course also in Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry, which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So he uses my course in Acts 20, 24, and my course in 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought a good fight. Christian life's a fight. It's a fight. It's a warfare. A lot of the new versions have done away with that, that uh, military words because they're little mamby-pamby wimps, and they, so they do away, and even a lot of the songbooks have, you know, about being a soldier of the Lord, that type of thing. They do away with that because they're little sissies. But a Christian life, well, you know how you know it's a fight? How many are really in it? I've seen men that had muscles clear out the here. Big old chest clear out the here. <laughs> Necks like this, lifting weights. Big old men. But when it comes to spiritual fighting the devil and the things of the world and things like that, they're little sissies. Yeah. <laughs> if you're going to fight, you got to fight. You know how you know it's a warfare? Because a lot of people started, but they ain't finishing so far. You say, well, something knocked him out. That's right. That's the devil's object. That's the devil's goal. He'll use one of a million things. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. My course. You have a course. So you'll stay at the judgment seat for your course. From the time you got saved until the time you die, God is going to talk to you about your course that time period. He's not going to talk to you about before you got saved. He's going to talk to you the moment you got saved until the time you die, a rapture. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is going to be about. That's what the Lord is going to talk to us about. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Every Christian is going to stand before the Lord. So it's a fight. So he says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. 
Right? The faith is the body revealed truth, the word of God. He says, I, was Paul perfect? No, he wasn't perfect. But he was still able to say that at the end of his life. See, we're not talking about being perfect. We're not talking about being perfect. Paul wasn't perfect. Paul messed up a lot of times. Told not to go to Jerusalem two or three times in the book of Acts and still went. Yeah. And got in a mess when he went. Sat in jail for two years. We went over it in our verse by verse study in Acts. Sat in jail for two or, was it two or three years, at least two. Two years, and because he got out of the will of God. Because he did what he wanted to do. That's the Apostle Paul. But at the end of his life, he was able to say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. You have a course to run. Are we perfect? No. But we can run our course. The Lord wouldn't ask us to run our course if we couldn't. So he wants us to... Uh, he wants us to serve him. God isn't asking us to be some super duper saint. None of us are. I'm not. You're probably not. Just reasonable service. Yeah. Romans 12, 1 and 2. God knows we're nothing. God knows we're but dust. Amen. That's what we are. Before I got saved, there was a rock group called Kansas. They had a song that said, all we are is dust in the wind. It's kind of depressing, but... <laughs> But basically, you know, we're dust. And God, and he says that back in Psalms. He remembers that we're but dust. So he's not asking you to be a super duper saint. He's not asking me, thank God, to, I, I can't do that. But he, he wants us to serve him. He voluntarily went to the cross of Calvary and laid down his life on the those Roman soldiers didn't have to tussle with him and fight with him and say, come on, come on. He wasn't resisting them. I believe he walked right over there and laid down on it. Amen. Now, it doesn't specifically say that, but there was no resistance. Right. That's what he came here to do. Yeah. I've mentioned many times, think about this. Think about it. Jesus knew when he was going to die, where he was going to die, and how he was going to die. You don't. I don't. For 33 and a half years, he knew when he's going to die, where he's going to die, and how he's going to die. He knew the exact spot. He knew how he was going to die, where, and when the time. Remember the one time in John 7? He said, my time has not yet come. John 7, verse 6. He knew when he's going to die. He knew when they was going to murder him. Think about that. I mean, if I knew that I was going to be nailed to a cross, I mean, I get a little splinter in my finger, and I scream and cry and act like a big baby, and I want my wife to hurry up, please hurry up, get a, get a needle and sterilize it and get that thing out of there, and she gets it out, it's going, oh, you can't even hardly see the thing. That calls that much pain? He had nails, hands and his feet. Yeah. And before that, they beat him half to death. You said, what did he do that for? He probably didn't have nothing else to do that day. He just thought he'd get murdered and crucified. He did that for the sins of the world. Yeah. So you and I wouldn't have to go to hell. Yeah. And then you got people that say, uh, I got my own religion. Uh, I, I, I've been baptized. That's what I'll trust in. I got. I, I think I'm just as good as the guy down the street. He says he's a Christian. I got good works. They don't realize it, but when they say that, this is what they're doing to Jesus. Yeah. I don't need you, Jesus. Appreciate you. Appreciate you going to the cross and being beaten beyond recognition and all that. That's good. That's good. I thank you for that. But I think I'm pretty good. I think that I can make it. And I belong to the church. And I have communion every Sunday. And I partake of the Mass, the sacraments. I've been sprinkled or I've been baptized by immersion. And I think I'm all right. But Jesus died for you. He, he's the only way you can get to heaven. Ah, 
I got my own religion now, I don't want to hear it. And they'll die and go to hell and burn forever. Amen. Just as simple as that. You say, but they're sweet and they're nice. I bet them they're real nice and sweet. It don't matter how sweet and nice they are. Rusty nails might melt in their mouth. They're so sweet and religious. But they're saying no to Jesus Christ. <coughs> and that's why God will have no problem at all. Whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Won't have no problem at all doing it. I'm not saying God will enjoy it, but he'll have no problem in doing it. God meets out justice. He don't sit up there and laugh about it and say, oh, look, is that the way you're going to be? Then I'm going to throw you, throw you right into hell, buddy. I'll show you. God isn't like that. God says, you rejected my son. Right into hell they go. But I got baptized. I ain't going to do it. I joined the church. I was religious. I gave you the cancer and leukemia societies. They come around, I gave a few bucks. I was a good neighbor. I was religious. But did you accept my son, Jesus Christ? No. Into hell they go. Into hell they go. Yeah. 